For the Wild is brought to you in part by the Calliopeia Foundation, who support reconnecting ecology, culture, and spirituality. We are grateful for their continued support and the support of grassroots contributions from listeners like you. Learn more at calliopeia.org. To make a donation, visit forthewild.world slash donate, or find us on Patreon. If you'd like to support us in other ways, consider sharing our episodes through social media or leaving us a review wherever you listen to the podcast. Hello and welcome to For the Wild podcast. I'm Ayana Young. Today I'm speaking with Josefina Skerik. Instead of of putting things in books, we put them into the land. So the land is our library. Josefina Skerik is a Sami politician with a background in law. She is the general manager of Siti Yarnge, a Sami language and cultural center in Norway. Skerik has been a member of the Sami parliament in Sweden since 2013 and has held office as its former vice president. Indigenous rights, especially connecting to land and language rights, are key issues that she is passionate about. Her work involves highlighting the diversity of the Sami people and striving for human and indigenous rights for all Sami, regardless of gender, sexuality, disability, or cultural background. Well, Josefina, this is so amazing to connect with you because it has been years in the making. I remember meeting you at COP21 in Paris, which was feels like a lifetime ago when I was with IEN and Jade Begay. So this is just such an incredible moment to be connecting with you in this way so many years later. Thank you. Yeah, it's really, really nice to at least hear you again. <laughs> um. mm, yes, I'm very excited. And I'd like to ask you about your ancestral homelands of the Sapmi. I'm wondering if you can situate us in the sights, smells, and sounds of this vast traditional territory. Absolutely. Our traditional territory is located in what's now the northern parts of Norway, Sweden, Finland, and the Kola Peninsula in Russia. So it's a large part of it is in the Arctic. So it's a kind of harsh climate with long winters and uh, this beautiful midnight sun during the days. The smells would be clean water rushing down the mountain slopes, the deep forests, um, cloudberries, reindeer, moose, fish and birds and all of these kinds of sounds, uh, at least in the unexploited parts because we are really threatened by industries and uh, just land grabbing and theft going on. My favorite time of the year is in the fall when it's moose hunting season. And it's not because I'm particularly bloodthirsty I'm actually a bad hunter. <laughs> but what I love about it is that I get to follow my elders around in a way that doesn't really happen any other time of the year. I come from a background of Samis that have been hunting and fishing. And so our culture is, is tied to those traditions. And when I move across the land with my elders, they whisper stories to me that they are reminded of when they cross a certain creek or when we move through a valley and we see that rock. And I've come to realize that every tiny little place, rocks and creeks and valleys and lakes and shorelines and trees even have stories connected to them. They've got names. Uh, and they, the stories can be about different aspects. Um, they can be about spirituality. Um, my elders teach me about how animals move, how they think. Um, 
and a lot of the stories are connected to previous generations. I know how to imitate people that have been dead a long time before I was born, just because when we move across that place, the elders tell me that story. <laughs> And, and, tell, and, and with the tradition of storytelling, they can put themselves into that person. So the Sami language hasn't been a written language for very long. Instead of, of putting things in books, we put them into the land. So the land is our library. So when people come and say that, well, we could, we want to, to uh, put a mine here, but we'll compensate you with money. How do you ever compensate that with money? It's impossible <laughs> to even grasp that that could be a question. I want to, I also want to be 90 years old and tell my kids and grandkids and their kids those stories. That's my, my dream of my future. And the Sami territory might be vast, but for individuals, our lands are not that big. There are, the, the, there are libraries, there are entire history. Well, thank you for situating and grounding us in your homelands and I wonder if you could explain a bit more about the nuanced history of the Sami as indigenous people and their relationship to Scandinavians more broadly. And because many of our listeners will have a very North American centric understanding of colonization and indigeneity, I wonder if you can begin with a bit of an introduction as to who the Sami are and how your territories have been impacted by European nation states and kingdoms vying for power throughout the ages. Yeah, we share a lot of history with other indigenous peoples. And that's what I find so powerful when we meet in various situations. Um, we've lived in our territory for such a long time. And then uh, the states were formed or at least the kings or all of that happened uh, in the south and they started to look up north uh, into our territories and claiming them and relocating, forcibly relocating us even further north up in our territories. And they sent the church as they often do and forced a Christianization on us um, the traditional Sami religion is shamanistic, um, a form of it. So we went through a, a lot of similarities with other indigenous peoples in that forced Christianization, they put our children in boarding schools where they were not allowed to speak their language or practice their cultures. Uh, some children were forced into us certain kind of schooling for the ranger herding families where the children were on the opposite end forced to continue some of the traditional practices but in the shape that was approved by the state uh, and they weren't allowed to speak their language either so it was a lot of control a lot of racism forced sterilization just all kinds of abuse and then the land grabbing, they stole all of our lands. Um, so, so just, it's a terrible history and it's Sweden and the other countries are still not living up to even the basic indigenous rights that we had, that they have agreed to on the human level and still they're ignoring it back home and they're constantly getting criticized by various, I mean, UN um, uh, organs and such, and other nations. It's so important to speak to people with a voice like yours and to raise awareness on our situation. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and 
And I've heard that the Sami are often referred to as Europe's only indigenous peoples. And I can't help but also think about the ways in which many Europeans have severed themselves from indigenous histories, both willfully and forcibly. You speak about the history of eradication and forgottenness of Sami and how these are not mutually exclusive. So I'm wondering if you could share with us what the ramifications are of erasing Sami history from European and Euro-descendant minds when it comes to connecting with place and ancestors. Mm. I think that what Europe's done is to create this new idea about themselves. The golden states of human rights, totally forgetting what they've done all around the world and in their own territories. And I do think that the majority of people wouldn't stand behind the things that are happening today but they're not aware of what's going on. So the only ones that are lobbying politics today are the industries, the powerful multinational industries. And it's just repeating itself over and over since there are no, it's no real, the children are not educated in school about, about what's going on and not another way of life either. They're just always this idea of what success is, what high status is, and how we should live our lives constantly striving for a larger car, a bigger house, higher salary, instead of, of wealth in other ways, connection and roots and community. Um, and the relationship that we could have, and the Sami still have a lot of us, the relationship to nature and seeing ourselves as a, as a part of it, instead of something that is looking down on it, that we're giving and taking, that we're, that we're like interconnected and caring for each other in a way that I think people long for to have that relationship with nature and of course some do it's not something that that only indigenous peoples have but it's something that we are great as, uh, at as a people uh, and sustainable values we could create a better world for everyone if we listen more to indigenous peoples Mm -hmm. Absolutely. And yeah, as a follow up to my last question, and a precursor to our conversation on extractive industry and reconciliation. I'm wondering how is Sami indigeneity understood traditionally? And how has it been defined by the Swedish state? Traditionally, our own way of defining ourselves is through kinship to be related to someone else who's recognized as a part of our people. And that is also the common way that indigenous people recognize each other. As indigenous peoples, we're often, it, the concept is often misunderstood sadly. It's not about who was the very first. It's about who were living on the land when it was colonized by a state. We were living in the north of Sweden and Norway, Finland and the Kola Peninsula when the states were formed, when the states took our lands. So that is what being <laughs> the, the, like the, the UN definition of indigenous peoples are. And that is also why indigenous people have certain rights they are there to ensure that we are not discriminated against and that the history of denying and trying to eradicate our cultures won't continue. And that is also why it's so detrimental 
when the states do not even fulfill those very low standards of what they have to do to ensure that we have the possibility to lead our own development, to continue our cultures and pass them on to our kids and coming generations. And your other part of the question was, how do the state define us? Well, at least I live, a, I'm from the Swedish side of Zapmir. And here the state has for such a long time defined us as reindeer herding people and all other Sami backgrounds. Those were uh, living off handicrafts or hunting, fishing, uh, small scale farming. All of them were just never recognized and the state just wanted to assimilate everyone uh, from those backgrounds and strictly control uh, reindeer herders and kind of shape them into what they understood as a proper Sami. And that idea of what a proper Sami is, is still continued today. The only legislation that we have in Sweden today for our rights is entirely dependent on that you are reindeer herding. Uh, not everyone, or very, very few of us have the possibility to, to pick that up. And there's also very strict laws surrounding who could do that. And the, the, what we want, all of us, is just to have the basic rights recognized. So if you're a, a Sami from a, say, fishing background, you'd like to be able to continue to fish and teach your children about those traditions and those lands. And just those, those very basic concepts of being able to pass your traditions on to the next generation and to live in them today. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I'm, I'm wondering, what are the implications of the state's definition in terms of land development? The problem is that we are not recognized as rights holders or not very strong rights holders. So the states view themselves as allowed to do more or less whatever they want on our lands. And the majority of the Sami people are not in any way recognized as being able to, for instance, in court argue their case on why something should not be done. So if there were a company wanting to place a big mine in my traditional territory, there's probably nothing I could do about it except maybe activism and well, political work, but I could never take it to court because I'm not recognized as a rights holder even though my family, we've lived there for hundreds, if not thousands of years uh, before the Swedish state were formed, it used to be our lands. They have no papers or deeds to it. It's, it's so, so frustrating and heartbreaking. One example of what the state is doing today is, well, for instance, then in Sweden, they're trying to, to make themselves out as this amazing state when it comes to climate change, that they're doing this green energy shift. But what they're actually doing is building huge windmill industry parks in our traditional territories. They're blasting mountains, and just creating these large industrial places and cutting down huge, old, beautiful forests and placing these uh, um, so super large windmill parks, thousands of those mills uh, in our lands, and in some ways finalizing the eradication of us through this, this green energy here. They're not building a future together with us. They're erasing us. Seasons 
change still Even though the world's on fire Safina, it's really disheartening to hear this, but yeah, I'm I'm also glad that you're sharing that that's what's happening there. And I see these troubles with green energy happening all over the world, especially to indigenous communities and how impacted they are with these green or renewable energy projects. And there's so many sacrifice zones that are not being highlighted enough and I'm really I'm glad that you brought that up and yeah I you know we're hearing more and more stories of how also changing winter landscapes are making lifeways non-viable and across uh, Sapmi snow is falling before the ice can even set making reindeer husbandry increasingly difficult So what exactly is transpiring during these winter months and how does it fit in with the larger story of changing landscapes and the impact that that has on traditional livelihoods? We saw climate change coming many years ago, just as you say, especially in the winter. Um, The rivers used to be our uh, highways where you would move easily during the winter time and you'd know because it was traditionally told from generation to generation all of this knowledge passed down on where it was safe to move how you could think what you should do to keep yourself safe to keep the reindeer safe Um, and it's getting less and less relevant (laughs) because climate is becoming more and more unpredictable so we're kind of the, the, like many indigenous peoples, the first to be impacted by climate change and also the ones that are, as you said, suffering from uh, climate mitigation efforts. Yeah, no, it's really important to hear. And yeah, I'm just thinking about the reindeers and the windmills and the ice and the changing climate. There's a lot that's impacting your homelands that it just feels so important for us to hear this information and I appreciate it. And countries like Norway and Sweden have begun to look at reconciliation, primarily by setting up commissions to begin addressing the reality that Nordic countries have used the Sami to test scientific theories have forcibly sterilized hundreds of Sami women, refuse to teach the language, and as I understand it, continue to negate indigenous history in schools across Scandinavia. However, I think most of us can acknowledge that time and time again, commissions show up empty-handed. So I'd like to ask you, what does proper reconciliation look like for a colonial project that has not only extracted people from the land in the pursuit of material wealth, but specifically, how does climate change and the reality that traditional homelands are changing need to be factored into these conversations as well? There is such a large need, huge need for more knowledge about what the states have done to us and for people to be able to tell their stories and for it to be written down and so that no one can deny what happened. And especially before the older generation, the ones who, 
I would say as a generation suffered the most before they pass away and lose that possibility for some kind of proper apology or something, it would never be enough, but just to see that it's recognized. But reconciliation can never be anything without actual action. We need to have our rights recognized. The states need to stand up for what they've done and to stop repeating what they, they're still doing. But as you say, we've seen again and again that they are not strong enough. And I think it's so important that we focus on the mandate of the Truth Commission, that we truly try to use the knowledge that has been built up of what has worked and what has not worked and build relationships with other peoples that have had Truth Commissions or that are working on them. So concretely reconciliation here, I'd say would be to recognize Sami uh, ownership rights, or at the very least rights to use our traditional land and continue our traditional practices. And also to establish in other places or as a whole, a practice of viewing land and using land, living with the land that is sustainable and that is rooted in respect and rooted in recognizing that generations to come will also live here. It's not about what looks good at the next election. It's about what looks good several generations ahead mm -hmm. yeah I'm mm -hmm. yeah just sitting with that thank you and I understand that one of the greatest threats to Sami lifeways is mining especially with Sweden emerging as a potential mining center for all of Europe and you know when we think about iron copper or gold mining we don't immediately think of Sweden but in the past few years, Sweden has granted roughly 500 mining exploration permits. So what is the current status of mining in Sápmi and what resources is Sweden looking at to extract and for what purpose? As you say, Sweden are, is really trying to take the role of, of Europe's number one mining country. And they're already producing or uh, taking out 98% of Europe's total iron ore production. And it's mined in our traditional territories, in some traditional territories. And there's not one, nothing of that is going back to the Sami people. So it's, it's a lot of iron and copper and all kinds of minerals, gold. I mean, if they're trying to, argue that they're mining for things that people need. Sometimes they say, well, everyone around the globe deserves to have a refrigerator. So we need to mine for minerals so we can build that. Well, there's zero need for gold. We have more than enough already up on land, but there's still still pushing for that and it's so easy to see that it's all for profits and short-sighted profits there's a lot of speculation going around with the mines these projects that will never be viable but someone who's really good at arguing might be able to to push it on a poor municipality because the municipalities in the Sami territory is also very poor. Even though there's so many mines, there's so much forest industries, hydropower, windmill parks, but the money is going south. It's going into the state and the state is very bad at giving back. 
or it's going into multinational companies. So there's a lot of, uh, of speculation, as I said, with, with the mining, that it's just there. So there's been a lot of, of bankruptcies that has left our territory with poisoned places that the state has to, to um, clean up for hundreds of millions. And they are really slow at doing that as well. So um, but what we're seeing is that we're being able to join hands with environmental organizations and activists from all over the world and forming these strong alliances um, together also with uh, majority Swedish populations that are living in these territories. So we're, we're building a stronger and stronger resistance. Um, I, I truly think that we're moving towards a better future, but we need everyone in this struggle. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Yeah, and Hearing about the impacts of mining across Sapmi is yet another reminder that Big Green, when rolled out, comes at the expense of indigenous sovereignty. And in some ways, I see it as another manifestation of the belief that we can transcend the world through colonial endeavors like religion, capital, and now techno fixes. So, yeah, many think that we can absolve ourselves from current global afflictions through green technology, but electric cars and hydropower are not even closely synonymous with true sustainable living. These two are colonial interests. So I'd like to pose the question to you, what does sustainable living look like at this point in time? It's a very good question because I can see in my own life that I'm also overusing the world's resources. It's really difficult for us, I think, in the Western part of the world to recognize what we need to do. But in the small scale, what I would want to share with everyone who's listening is for instance, something that I think, a small thing that I think is beautiful within the Sami culture is a high status thing is to be able to create your own traditional outfit. If you can do that, if you're skilled enough, then you're really, really highly regarded. Well, I think that in the majority society, to make your own clothes is looked down on. It's something that poor people do. I wonder what would become of the majority if you'd revalue that to reuse, to truly value what is handed to you from an older generation and to create yourself instead of relying on sweatshops in other parts of the world, instead of building your life around others suffering and exploitation of nature. So what I think we need to do, and myself included, is to truly look at our lives from the perspective of what really, what is what I need and what is what I'm being fed that I, I need. And I think what we need, what is sustainable is of course a house, or not, not a house, but a roof over our heads. Um, we need to be able to provide for ourselves in some way, but I think community um, could replace so much of the consumption that we are just, I think, comfort 
eating ourselves through life with. Um, and I also think there is so much joy to be found in creating yourself to do the small scale things, to growing your own food, to sharing with others. I think people will continue to, to view this as some kind of, again, look down upon hippie thing until more of us try it and realize the joy that it brings. Mm -hmm. I absolutely agree with you. <laughs> yeah, I, even this spring, I was in the garden and I was weeding and I just thought, well, I didn't think too much about it. I just thought, oh, like, I, I don't even know if I was excited about it at the beginning. Maybe I thought of it as more of a chore. And then just the simple act of weeding around the strawberries in the garden, it gave me such a sense of relief and purpose and groundedness and calmness. And, you know, this is just a very small example, but I noticed that things that maybe I would have written off before as unimportant or, you know, use the word hippie or, you know, things like that are kind of looked down upon or looked looked at as kind of um, not necessary or frivolous or, yeah, just not that deep, I guess. And what I'm noticing is these simple acts are so deep and so meaningful and so full of purpose and also for me personally slows me down in a way that helps me be in right relationship with the earth and I really hear that and appreciate you saying that and yeah I'm walk the stones to the place of our long gone family look for the one with light in her hair and tell her all that you see sister dear take this little silver bell up to the highest hill you see sing me a note just sing one note it is everything i know dark bird To kind of not switch topics entirely, but I'm curious to discuss a bit about the roles of land claims throughout uh, Sapthi, Sapni, excuse me, and how has the Sami community fared against the Swedish state? Are certain legal battles beginning to change the tide? And, you know, or in terms of transnational solidarity, what can we learn from one another in terms of how different states are responding to indigenous sovereignty? I do think that as politicians have kind of stepped aside, or as I said previously, that they're only listening to industry right now, the courts have taken the role that they should have um, stepped up to. So what we've done within the Sami people is to single out certain strategic cases and take them to court. And recently there was this case, the Gideas case, that the Sami people won. And the case is slightly problematic in some senses because it doesn't include all Samis. It can even be bad for some Samis. But as a recognition, recognition of our rights, um, I think it's a good foundation. We needed a win. And for, for many and for traditional 
livelihoods, especially reindeer herding, it's it's a step forward. And that has the that we won in court, in the highest court in Sweden, has scared the state. <laughs> so that now they're actually announcing that they are going to change the main law that regulates our rights and change it in a positive way. But again, it's really difficult to have any hopes because who are they listening to? There's of course a difference within the parties. There are some parties in Swedish parliament that are what we would perhaps call Sami positive. <laughs> but there, there's, there are those smaller ones. Uh, so the trouble with it, what's happening with the courts and, and what they're doing there, uh, or what some Samis are doing there, is that court decisions are black and white solutions to a problem that is grayscale, uh, that is, uh, or maybe rainbow colored. <laughs> So we need, we need political solutions and we need solutions that we lead, we shape according to our culture, legal practices, um, values and norms, uh, to, according to our society, our right to self-determination. That I think is many years ahead though, <laughs> until it happens. But, but uh, yes, when it comes to what is what is happening and what is super important, I say that the development that is going on in courts, that they're actually also saying that the rights that has been negotiated in the UN should be applied to the Samis in Sweden and also in other countries. I'm thinking about this next question in context to our previous conversation on the centrality of reindeer and winter. And in preparing for this interview, I read that the Sami language is so advanced when it comes to describing ancestral homelands and kin, that it's one of the most studied languages in the world today. As a fervent protector of language, can you speak to your work to protect the Sami language and its role in world making? not just in terms of it being studied, but in its living presence as a language spoken amongst each other in servitude of more than human kin and the land. Mm. The Sami language is so diverse. It's reflects, truly reflects our culture. It is the world view uh, that is being transmitted I mean that you that you get through the language. So, for instance, how you how you say uh, it's not just well, well in English and in Swedish you'd say I and you and uh, you'd say we as a whole group or maybe just we as two and them some way but when you in the Sami language you'd also have a possibility to use a certain word that is for us too for, to describe the closeness of it's just me and you and we're doing something together and also, in many other ways, there's a, for instance, in the South Sami language, which you recently published an article that that is actually the language with the most words for snow in the world. <laughs> and it's not symbolically, it doesn't, that hasn't developed by accident. It's because you, we've lived and had to survive in this very harsh environment, doing very specialized yet adaptable uh, practices, livelihoods, 
that were dependent on nature resources uh, or is and still living, uh, such as snow. So, and there's also uh, today economic argument to language, to Sami languages. There's such a huge need to recruit people that speak Sami in all kinds of parts of society today, in at universities, at, uh, in media, in municipalities, hospitals, in schools. So there's nothing that a kid can study in school and be more certain that they'll get a job than some. Sadly, it's still viewed as something um, that is useless by the majority society, that why would they ever need to study Sami, study English instead, study Swedish, study Chinese. And they can't see that, well, that's great to do that, but it's also really, really good to study Sami. It's a language for the future. So what I try to do is to, to try to explain that, to push for stronger laws so that kids and adults and elders will have their rights um, truly recognized. And then, and also not only rights, but what we need to revitalize the language, to keep the language alive, to develop it, and also ensure proper funding because the state has for several hundreds of years tried to eradicate the, our language. They have not succeeded. Truly, truly ensure that it has possibility to survive into the future. There's a lot of funding needed. We need, for example, to be able to give scholarships for people to study to become teachers or work in kinder kindergartens. Um, and I also think that it would be something that the state should generally do because we should not ourselves have to pay to reclaim something that the state has stolen from us. My grandmother's generation were beaten in school if they spoke Sami. It was viewed as, as something shameful to be Sami. That it was it was viewed as something that was dangerous to be Sami. And people tried to protect their children by not speaking the language, and in many cases, not even telling their kids that they are Sami. It might be something that they would understand that they were when their parents would get old and maybe start to retreat and only use their mother tongue for me when they perhaps got dementia. <laughs> We've had several cases of that, but that is the moment when kids realize the weight where for me. Because it isn't gibberish that my mother is speaking. It's actually another language. Um, and so, so to keep our language alive, there's a lot of things that need to be done. But on a positive note, there's so many that really want to use their language, that want to develop their language, and so, so many that want to reclaim it kids that are really striving for it and parents that are doing whatever they can to ensure that their children and themselves can reclaim the language and elders that are starting to become proud of the fact that they speak it. 
uh, it's a beautiful development within the Sami people. Mm -hmm. This reminds me of when I saw you speak for the first time, and I think you said something like, we don't, we're not strawberry jam. We don't want to be preserved. And it just reminds me of the difference between something living and moving and something that isn't controlled by another group of people like the language, but it's actually being lived and breathed life into. Um, and that's so beautiful. I'm really happy you spoke to that. Thank you. I, I once got the question from a BBC a journalist if I weren't just working to try to preserve something that belongs in a museum. And I think if, if they ask, if you ask that question, you truly miss the entire point. And you're really unaware of what's going on within indigenous cultures today. Because just as you said, we're living, we're developing. It's so much, I mean, we talk a lot about the struggles, the pain, but it's also so much joy. We're moving from many of us, not everyone, sadly, being a, we're being able to move away from the most dangerous parts of being indigenous. Um, and the kids that are growing up today, wow. I mean, there's an elder where I work now that says that she, I mean, she's so impressed by the youth because she herself, she was raised to be silent. She was raised to, to not defend herself. So when she sees the kids that are just protesting, they're claiming their rights. She's so proud of them and impressed of what's happening. We want, what we want is to lead our own development. Nothing more than that. We, we are not looking or asking anyone to, to force upon us their view of what we should be, which usually is something that is maybe what we were many, many years ago. And we still carry a lot of it with us today, but other things have changed. For instance, reindeer herders now, some of them now use drones to gather their reindeer instead of skiing. Um, that does not make reindeer herding any less valuable or culturally important. It's just developed. Yeah, Yusuf, you know, this has been such an uh, important conversation for me personally, and I know our listeners will feel really, um, yeah, mind expanded <laughs> from this conversation. So <laughs> thank you for all of the work you've been doing for so many years, standing for this land and for communicating these topics with so many people around the world. I appreciate your time today and all of the time that you've spent working for the earth. Absolutely. Well, it's so important to, to raise awareness within the international community about this. We need support from all over. And I also, also want to give support to other peoples. Let's never forget. Berta Caceres and all of the amazing indigenous leaders all around the world that have given their lives to protecting their lands. Thank you. Thank you so much. And I'd like to say thank you back to you for all that you are doing. I'm so honored to be here on your podcast. And it's been such a nice conversation.
Thank you for listening to For the Wild podcast. The music you heard today was by Andy Talent, Dana Anastasia, and West of Rowan. For the Wild is created by Ayana Young, Erica Ekram, Francesca Glassbell, and Julia Jackson. <laughs>